What up nerds, my name's Ryan. I did my HSE in 2019 and in this video, I will be guiding you through the three things you need to know about HSE projectile motion practical investigations. In addition to this video, I also have videos on the theory of projectile motion, common question types, and very detailed explanations of actual HSE questions. You can see all of that by clicking the link in the top right or visiting the channel page or looking in the playlist down in the description, any way you like, you can see those videos there. So the three things you need to know for projectile motion investigations are understanding scientific terminology, the collection and analysis of primary data, and of course, the most important is the ability to answer actual HSE questions when you're doing your trials and your final HSE exam. I will be going through each of these points individually. And for this point here, the example depth study, I'm going to show you all the pages of an actual depth study that I wrote during my HSE so that you can see exactly what you're gonna to need to do during your depth study assignment for physics. Anyway, moving on to the first point, understanding scientific terminology. So when you're doing a scientific experiment, when you're doing an investigation, one of the things that you have to do, one of the things that's absolutely critical that you do is to identify the independent variables, the dependent variables, and the controlled variables. So independent variables refer to variables refer to things that are being altered by the experimenter. So if you're testing how the launch angle of a projectile affects its horizontal range, then the independent variable in that case is the angle, because that's the thing that you're varying as the experimenter. How does the angle affect the horizontal range? In that sentence, you can tell that the angle is the independent variable. Is it it is the thing that is affecting something else. It is the thing that you are varying. And so independent variables are altered by the experimenter and they affect, they have an impact on, they make a change to, they affect the dependent variable. They affect the dependent variable. Okay, so then the next question then becomes, what is the dependent variable? Well, the dependent variable is what is being measured during the investigation. So what you as the experimenter are measuring, it's what's being tested, it's what's being measured. So the dependent variable is being tested slash measured by the experimenter. So in the example that I gave previously, you were investigating how does a change in a projectile's launch angle affect its horizontal range. So we know that the launch angle is the independent variable because it's the thing that you're changing. And we know that the horizontal range of the projectile is the dependent variable because it is the thing that you are measuring as the experimenter. The other way that you can define a dependent variable is that it's dependent on the independent variable. So it's dependent, maybe I'll use, actually I'll use the word affected, not affected, but effected. It is effected by the independent variable. So if you ask the question, how does a projectile's launch angle affect its horizontal range? That's how does the independent variable affect the dependent variable? How does the launch height affect the time of flight? How does the launch speed affect the vertical displacement? So you should be able to fit it into the sentence, how does the independent variable affect the dependent variable? Now consider the reverse of that. What if I were to say that the horizontal range of a projectile has an effect on its launch angle? Does that make sense? No, no, it doesn't make sense. If I asked you, well, how does the time of flight affect the launch speed of a projectile? That question makes no sense because it's, it's the wrong way around, right? It's how does the launch angle affect the horizontal range and how does the launch velocity affect the time of flight? You just need to be cognizant of the fact that independent variables impact dependent variables and dependent variables are impacted on by independent variables or they are determined by independent variables. If I drop this pen from this height, versus if I drop this pen from this height, the time that each of those drops took did not affect the height that I decided to drop it at. It's the other way around. The height that I decided to drop it at affected how long it took to fall. So that's something to be aware of, independent and dependent variables. So what are controlled variables? These are all the things that you're not testing. These are all the factors that are not relevant. These are all the things that need to be kept the same during the experiment. And so if we go back again to our launch angle horizontal range hypothetical investigation, if we're solely testing how does the angle affect the horizontal range, then we can't change its launch velocity. If we're testing how does a change in angle affect the horizontal range, we cannot change the planet that we are, we're on. We can't change 
the acceleration. If we're testing how does a change in angle affect the horizontal range, we can't change other things that could affect the horizontal range because then we don't know if it's the angle that caused the difference in the horizontal range or not. So controlled variables are things that must be kept the same, that must be kept constant by the experimenter. They are things that could affect the dependent variable, but we don't want to affect because we're not testing it. Controlled variables are things that you don't want affecting the result. You don't want affecting the thing that you're measuring. They're things that therefore must be kept the same during the experiment. All right, what's next? Validity, accuracy, and reliability. Okay, so all of these three terms, validity, accuracy, and reliability, are all qualitative descriptions, qualitative measures about the characteristics of your results and the characteristics of your experiment. And so what is validity? Okay, well, validity refers to the degree to which your experiment is actually assessing what you are trying to investigate. A valid experiment is one that is properly investigating the concept that you intend to investigate. So if we're investigating how does a change in launch angle, again, to back to the hypothetical example, how does a change in launch angle affect the horizontal range of the projectile? If we then do an experiment that keeps the angle at the same position and then changes the launch speed and then see how the launch speed affects the horizontal range, that's completely invalid because your intention was to investigate how a change in launch angle affected the horizontal range, not how a change in launch speed affected the horizontal range. So validity is a question. It's a question. Is this an appropriate way of investigating the concept I'm trying to investigate? And I'll use a very absurd example to really illustrate the point. Like, if you're trying to find out, will it rain today? And the means by which you figure that out is by flipping a coin. So heads, it rains, tails, it is sunny. So ta I got tails and it's actually raining right now. So what strikes you as weird about this? Well, the outcome of the coin flip has nothing to do with w whether it rains today or not. So my method of flipping a coin to determine whether it rains today or not is invalid because the outcome of what I'm measuring has nothing to do with the concept that I'm trying to investigate. A valid way of trying to predict whether it will rain today or not is by, you know, searching Google for the weather. That's a, that's a valid process that you could do. That's a valid action that you could take to address the concept of whether it rains today or not. So validity is the degree to which your experiment appropriately assesses the concept you are attempting to investigate. So you're just asking yourself the question, is this testing what I intend to test? Is this measuring what I intend to measure? Is this investigating what I intend to investigate? That's what validity is. All right, so next up is accuracy. I'll move this one a little further down here as well. So accuracy, I think this one is probably the most intuitive and the most well understood without explanation, but accuracy is how close a measurement is to its true value. So if I was to measure this pen, right? Firstly, I'd consider, okay, what's a valid way to measure this pen? Is putting it on a kitchen scale to determine its weight, is that a valid way of measuring its length? No. So first of all, you need to decide on a valid method to measure the length of the pen. And that might be a tape measure or a ruler or something that actually me measures length as opposed to measuring something else. So say I, okay, I choose a valid method, I choose a, a ruler. This pen has some particular length and it has a very, very, very specific length. And my ruler only measures to a millimeter. So I can only really get within half a millimeter of accuracy as to the legitimate length of this pen. So accuracy refers to how close a measurement is to the actual value of the thing being measured. So in this case, how close the measurement of the pen's length is to the pen's actual length. And sometimes you might hear how close it is to its accepted value. So that's when referring to certain things like, say the acceleration due to gravity at sea level, right? There's an accepted value in science for the acceleration there is an accepted value, 9.81, whatever the hell. And if you were to do an experiment with a valid method, trying to determine a quantitative value for that acceleration, accuracy can be used there to say, how, okay, how close was your result to the accepted value for acceleration? 
how close was your acceleration to the actual value or the accepted value? So accuracy refers to how close a measurement is to the true or accepted value. Yeah, accuracy is how close a measurement is to the true or accepted value of what that measurement should be, right? Okay, reliability. Basically, reliability refers to how close your measurements are to each other. So not how close they are to the actual value, not how valid your method was in determining them, but how close they are to each other, how similar they are to each other. So if we do our projectile motion experiment where we vary the angle and then we measure the horizontal range, if at a particular launch angle, at a particular height, at a particular acceleration due to gravity, there's all the control variables, we launch it at 40 degrees and we see it traveled one meter in one instance, it traveled two meters, it traveled six meters, it traveled half a meter. That's very unreliable data because it's coming in all over the place. But if we do the experiment 40 degrees and we get 1.2 meters, 1.21 meters, if you're getting results that are similar to each other, if you're getting results that are very close to one another, then they are considered reliable. So reliability refers to how close your values are, how close measured values are to each other. And it can not only be your experiment, if someone repeats your experiment, do they get the same results that you did for the horizontal range? If they do, then it's reliable. If they don't, then it's possibly unreliable. All right, so make sure you've got those three terms well understood. You've got those three terms ingrained and we want a high degree of all of these things for a good investigation. All right, next up we have systematic versus random errors. So systematic errors versus random errors. This can be a little tricky to distinguish, can be a little tricky to pass out the difference, but the best way to think about it is, is how is the error affecting the result? What is the effect of the error on the result? So systematic errors affect the accuracy of the result. So a systematic error will reduce the accuracy of a measurement. Systematic errors are consistent, and if you conduct the method of the experiment in the same way, then you will produce the same error. So this usually happens when you haven't calibrated the equipment properly or your method is invalid. So say you were trying to measure the weight of an apple and you got your kitchen scale, but you didn't calibrate the kitchen scale properly. You didn't tear it to zero when there was nothing on it. And right now, when there's nothing on, on it, the, uh, the kitchen scale says that it's detecting one kilogram. When you put the apple on the kitchen scale and you measure it, the kitchen scale is going to give you a value that is one kilogram higher than what the true value of the apple's mass is. The true value of the apple's mass. And each time you weigh it, it's going to produce that same one kilogram above. And it's the accuracy of your measurement that's being affected there. So systematic errors, they're consistent. They tend to be a result of uncalibrated measurement equipment. And all the measurements will be in one direction. So every time I measure that apple, the measurement that I get will be greater than the true measurement. It's in the same direction. It's not like one time I measure it will be less than the true mass and the other time that I measure it will be greater than the true mass. It's always greater than because it's calibrated in such a way that it displays one kilogram when there's actually nothing. So, so systematic errors affect the accuracy of a measurement. They are consistent and they a good example to think about is when an instrument is uncalibrated. All right, so random errors are a little less concrete in manner in terms of trying to conceptualize what random errors are. But they are definitely not consistent, so they are irregular, and that's in the name, right? They're random. They are unpredictable. They will not all occur in one direction. So if I, for whatever reason, if there's a random error from me measuring the mass of an apple, it's not always going to be greater than the actual mass, like we saw in the last example. It's gonna fluctuate up and down the, what the actual mass is, right? It doesn't af necessarily affect the accuracy of a result. It more so affects the reliability of a measurement. So we can remove systematic errors by ensuring that our method is valid, ensuring that our instruments are properly calibrated, you can never fully get rid of random errors, but you can reduce the extent to which they impact your results by repeating the experiment over and over and over and over and over. But because 
because random errors aren't in one direction, they're in, they fluctuate around the true value. The more experiments that you do, the more the average of the measurements will converge on the true value. So that's how you reduce random errors. That's the main way that you reduce random errors. And next we have the collection and analysis of primary data where I will briefly scroll through my depth study that I did in year 12. And you can you know pause the video and read it more thoroughly if you'd like to. So at some point during your HSC physics experience, you will have to do an assignment in which you conduct a practical investigation. And the one that I had to do was around projectile motion. And so you set it out like a, like a proper investigation paper. You have all the relevant titles, you have all the specific data and the method and all that. And we start with this inquiry question that in this case is, how will a change in the initial launch speed affect the time of flight of a projectile from a set height at zero degrees to the horizontal? So right there, I'm going to do this in different colors actually. The launch speed is the independent variable. The time of flight is the dependent variable. And the, and I mention a couple controlled variables there. So launch from a set height at zero degrees to the horizontal. So we have some controlled variables mentioned here. And the controlled variables are the height at which it's launched. Maybe I'll actually height. So the height at which the projectile is launched and the angle at which the projectile is launched. So that's the question. That's the, that's the thing that I am investigating in this depth study. That is the question that I'm trying to answer. How does the launch speed affect the time of flight of a projectile? All other relevant variables being constant. And so then I had an introduction where I basically explained some of the theory of projectile motion. I explain it both qualitatively and quantitatively with the kinematic equations. Again, I'm just going to be breezing through this so that you can see an example of what you'll be doing. If you want to read it specifically, pause the video. Uh, and then we have the scientific process here. So we have an aim to demonstrate the relationship between the time of flight and the projectile launch from a set height. At der, der, uh, really, that should be to demonstrate the relationship between the time of flight and the launch velocity of a projectile launched from a set height at zero degrees to the horizontal. That's a bit of a mistake there. <laughs> so hypothesis, when launched at zero degrees to the horizontal, the time of flight will be identical for projectiles launched at different velocities. So what I'm saying there is that the time that a projectile will take to land will be independent of the launch velocity if the projectile is launched directly to the horizontal. And so what's my reasoning for giving that hypothesis? Well, basically all this is saying that when you launch a projectile directly horizontally, the initial velocity in the y direction will be zero. And so it will not travel faster to the ground. It will not take longer to travel to the ground. So what I'm saying is that there's some, you know, there's some like bench here, launch the projectile off in that direction. No matter whether that is a small velocity or a large velocity, my, hypo my hypothesis is that it will not change the time of flight of the projectile's full path. And you can read all of this if you want to see the theoretical support for that. Risk assessment, this is something stupid that you have to do, uh, <laughs> where you basically just describe things that aren't really risks, and you pretend as if they're risks, and you categorize such risks. So, for example, eye slash face, ruler could penetrate eye, projectile could penetrate eye, precaution when handling the ruler. Usually for the depth study, at least in my case, and I assume that this is the usual thing for most people who are doing depth studies in HSC physics, your teacher will give you the assignment notification and the assignment notification will set out the, stru like the structure of what your investigation should be. And that's what I was following here. And your teacher will give you your own one. It'll most likely be very similar to this. So I have a list of equipment. There's my little launcher, which I have here. Actually, I still have it. It's a rubber band, launched marbles. So here's the method, control dependent and independent variables, diagrams, results. So how did I obtain these results? Well, you might use this thing called, I think it's called physics tracker. Uh, you might use this in class or you might use this for your depth study. And basically it's an, it's an application that you input videos into, input video files, and you can use it to track the motion of objects. 
In this case, you can use it to track the position of a projectile over time. And then from that, the program can give you data about its velocity, about its acceleration, about its time of flight, about all that stuff. I filmed myself launching the projectile at various different launch velocities and took those videos, put it into the program. It analyzed the motion of the projectile for me and then I took out all this data. And I'll show you that now actually. This is the one that we used, I think. And yeah, this is the one that we used. And it looks kind of old, but basically you can see here there was a video of, I think that's something either sliding up or sliding down a ramp. And if the video is good enough, the program will track a point on that object for you automatically. If your video isn't as good, then you like track it manually. And then it will output these graphs and output these values depending on whatever you want. Whatever you want to analyze, it will do that for you. So just a heads up, you'll probably be using this at some point. A lot of people found it very frustrating for some reason. Um, big tips would be light the room very well and try and use a camera with as high of a frame rate as you can get your hands on. So those are, those are the tips there. Anyway, here are some results, some graphs, a discussion of why the results are the way that they are, comment on the accuracy, the validity, and the reliability as it relates to this particular experiment, and a conclusion and a bibliography. There are some good resources. Just kidding, this video is the best resource. Out of all the resources, this is the best one. This is the best resource. Okay, now the most important thing would be your ability to answer questions relating to HSC physics projectile motion investigations in your trials and your HSC exams. Here are some examples from the actual HSC papers that you can look at. So for interpreting and representing data, you can look at my video on projectile motion questions easy at the time code two minutes and 21 seconds. You can find that video by clicking the playlist at the top right in the description or on my channel page. Also here, there's a question on interpreting and representing data in the hard projectile motion questions video at 31 minutes and eight seconds. And for error detection, there's an example of it in projectile motion questions video for medium difficulty at 21 minutes and one second. And so to go and watch those videos now, the next video is here is the easy projectile motion questions video. And the second end card takes you to the entire module five advanced mechanics playlist. You can go there, you can find the easy, the medium and the hard projectile motion questions. And so yeah, good luck. And I'll see you in the next video.